You're listening to the How in the World podcast, where we tackle global issues and discuss how we as Christians can make a lasting difference. My name is Rini Charest, and I pastor in the heart of the Central Valley in beautiful California. I'll be sitting down with guests from every walk of life to discover innovative ways that we can make an impact. This is the How in the World podcast. Welcome to How in the World podcast. I'm your host, Rini Charest, and I have an incredible person with me today, Dr. Marco Samedi, and we're going to talk about why in the world we would consider missions, especially during and at the end of this global pandemic. And here's a man who has an incredible life story. Let's hear what he has to say. It's going to make a big difference, and be sure to share this with a friend. So, Doctor, I have a question for you. I, was, I forgot that you're in your uh, life, you actually started, you were born in Ethiopia, and you were able to get to Italy as a refugee at 16, and then to the United States to uh, live here. How did that happen? So I was born in Ethiopia. Ethiopia was a communist country at the time. So mom and dad, with the little income they have, they sent uh, me and my older brother, who was 18, to Italy to just be out of Ethiopia uh, because of civil war. The country was grabbing every teenager to be involved in the war. Mm. So that was our way out. And thank God that was also where I came to know Jesus in Rome, Italy. And uh, so Rome is my favorite place in the whole world. I love Rome. And how did you get from Italy to the United States? So in Rome, we applied for a green card as uh, to come to the States. And uh, two years later, the United States government gave us a green card to come, and we moved to California. When you went to UC David and you received your medical degree? Yes. Uh, before that, I attended Santa Clara University. Uh, yeah, that, that is uh, very uh, meaningful. In Rome, the Catholics were helping us, and especially the Jesuits priests. In fact, I was one of the youngest refugees, so they gave me a job at the headquarter right by the Vatican. And uh, when I told them I was moving to Santa Clara, California, they said, uh, go and talk to the people there at Santa Clara University. So two weeks after my arrival, I didn't know, but I went to Santa Clara University, which was a walking distance where I, from where I used to live. And then I said, who do I talk? And so I saw this undergraduate admission, I went in. Thank God I saw a priest. So I said, maybe I should talk to him. And I told him my story. And to my surprise, he said, I have a letter from Rome to help you. Wow. And they gave me a scholarship to do my first degree there and then went to UC Davis for medical school. Now you have a, a practice here in Fresno, California. And anyone who looked at your life story would say, here's a guy that now is living the American dream. Yet... With all your success in 2002, you started the Horn of Africa missions, and now you go back to Ethiopia and many other countries to help people in the, in the Horn of Africa. So why would someone who leaves Ethiopia, finds the American dream, what would compel you? What, what is calling you? What is your passion that says to you, you need to go back to Ethiopia and help people from another country? Explain that attitude, how, why that's, that's happened to you? I learned about the American dream, and I found out actually it's a, a nightmare, not a dream. <laughs> Explain that. I want to hear, what does that mean? Someone described it well for me. The American dream is to buy things you don't need with the money you don't have to impress people you don't like. And that's how people live. A lot of people live they spend money they don't have to impress people they don't like. And often what they bought, what they spend their money, they don't need it. So God gave me a kingdom vision. A kingdom being God has a plan in this world. And his plan is to win men and women from every people group, from every language, from every nation. He wants them to be family members. As I am a family member of God, my job is to win people to become sons and daughters of the Most High. So this passion in 2002, 
ignited my heart, my family's life. And we started this ministry. So now we go to places where they have little or no access to the good news of Jesus Christ. So we want to be going those who are last to hear, they become our priority. We give them our best, our first, so that they will hear the good news. So when you, now here you're a doctor. Mm -hmm. So when do you go there as a doctor? How, you know, what, how do you represent yourself when you go back to Ethiopia, Sudan, wherever you're, wherever you're going? So we do some medical mission work, but medical mission work is very frustrating to uh, be truthful. I'm um, internist. My job is taking patients' history, do blood work, do CAT scan, X-ray, find what's going on, give them medication to fix that problem. It works well here. In Africa, you could diagnose somebody with diabetes or high blood pressure or heart disease. Then you don't have any medicine. You could give them enough for a month or two, but after that, they will be the same place where they were. Right. Um, so instead, sometimes what we do is we raise up the local medical doctors to do the work in Africa for a fraction of the money. But for us, it is working with the churches, raising up men and women who are passionate to take the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to people who've never heard. And then they will plant churches so that they will worship God. I'll tell you one example. Uh, this was 2011. In fact, a couple of my American friends were with me. We went to the southwestern part of Ethiopia. Uh, we call it the South Omo region of Ethiopia. And these are people who've never heard Jesus. Uh, so we went there as a vision trip to learn about these people, how they live life, what do they believe, how can we introduce this good news that changed my life, that changed all of our lives so that they will come to love this Jesus. So while we were there one day in, in the hotel room, uh, somebody said, they have an engagement party of this people group. Do you want to go and watch? We said, that's great. We came here to learn the culture. Mm -hmm. Please arrange someone. So they gave us a tour guide. Basically, he will go with us in a van and he will direct us. He will take half an hour. He will tell us, turn here, turn there. Of course, there's no street signs or anything like that. So there's no way we'll find it. So he was helping us. He was sitting in the back. He was giving direction to the driver. And then my friend who was next to me, he told him, Ike, the guy's name, the true guide name. I said, he said, Ike, do you, love, do you love Jesus? This is honest answer. Ike said, who is Jesus so that I could love him? I was shocked. This guy never heard of Jesus. Then my friend told Ike, you're right. If nobody told you about Jesus, how can you know Jesus? He said, we don't know your people group, but now we have you, a tour guide. You're going to show us where these people are. We're going to see. We're going to believe. And then he said, we are the tour guide of Jesus. Jesus sent us to your community so that we will tell you about Jesus. Now he got connected. So my friend says, Marcus, would you tell him? So in the next 20 minutes, I told him how God created the heaven and the earth, how God created man and how sin enters into the world. Now how God raised up a solution for our sin through Jesus by believing the work of Christ on the cross. We will have, will be born again, will become family members of God. Before we arrive at the engagement party, Ike received Jesus. I thought it was a joke. I said, that's easy. Then I can say this, who's gonna go to my mom and my dad's village? They never heard this good news. I was like, these people look like they are enemy of the gospel, but they are just lost because nobody told them Jesus. Mm. Yeah? So it is our delight to go to those people who have little or no access and be the first one to share the good news. That's and beautiful. often they are welcoming to and love him and follow Jesus. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful story. Now, that incredible story from uh, Dr. Zamedi reminds me of something that was written about his nonprofit in an organization called, I think, it, I think it's, is it Morningstar or is it, uh, it's, it's a uh, organization that rates nonprofits. Guidestar. Guidestar, thank you, mm -hmm. Guidestar. And this is what it says, that he's planted tens of thousands of churches through this organization and they are 
Christ-honoring, culture-affirming churches. What is a Christ-honoring, culture-affirming church? What does that mean? The church is built by Jesus. Jesus said, I will build my church. So it is his church. But the church looks different from people group to people group, from nation to nation. Uh, here in the U.S., uh, church often happens inside a nice sanctuary, uh, air-conditioned and comfortable, and otherwise people will not come. In many cultures in Africa, uh, there is no building like that. Uh, they do business, they do their uh, courts and marketings out in the open. So the church must look like the community. So they gather under a tree. They, op uh, they gather in the open field, just like what the community does. So we want to be Christ honoring. They must honor Christ. They must obey the instruction of Jesus from the Bible. At the same time, the church has to be their own. Yeah. Uh, someone said this one time, I believe an Indian guy to the Westerner. He said, please don't bring us the tree. Please send us the seed so mm -hmm. that the seed will grow in our own soil so that it will be our own. That's beautiful. Sometimes we take the church from the West and plant it yeah. in places and it will be yeah. weird. It's like say, what yeah. is this? So that's what it means. We plant churches that they will say, this is mine. So you preserve the culture of the community, but you bring Christ to that culture. Exactly. In fact, I could tell you stories after stories where many people from different religions who come to Christ now, and they say, the reason we are believers today is you never changed our culture. We still dress the same way. We still have mm. our old name. We still do things the same way. The only thing changed is that we now follow Christ. And, and that opens so many people's hearts to love and follow Christ. You know, we have kind of uh, been talking about, and I've heard it all over the place now, and I've heard it from many speakers from, from many nations, that we are in a new era. Something has happened, and we are in a new era. And it was like a dynamic change that happened. The globe suddenly became one quickly. We know part of it is social media. We know part of it is currencies are starting to meld. We've got Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. You know, people are finding new ways to decentralize, and, um, the, and the average person is getting a voice. And so my question is, since we see the barriers falling, why is it still so difficult for nations to get along? Why is there so much, in your opinion, violence and, and, and disunity between nations? That's a big question, and uh, it's not a simple answer. In every uh, place where there is fighting and violence, uh, there are so many root causes. Uh, I'll tell you right now in Ethiopia, uh, there is a fight in northern Ethiopia. And uh, there is a lot of source. But at the bottom, you'll find sin. People want power. People want to remain, uh, to become powerful. And, uh, and, and all those things play a role. The solution is always Christ. The solution is always to come and love and follow Christ. Uh, Jesus, when he came and lived among us, he never became powerful. Mm -hmm. He became a servant leader. He washed the feet of the disciples. He told them, if you want to be first, be last. And he showed them how to love someone. Whenever there is that, and we find that in church, we find that in some communities, there is always a lasting peace. But whenever Christ is out, then darkness comes. Whenever Christ is not king, then man becomes 
uh, replacing that place and darkness will come and wherever there's darkness there's always all kind of problems now i know one of the uh pushbacks that i get from those who are not familiar with the church or with missions of any kind they know as we watch the violence like in africa it's mostly between christians and muslims islam and christianity and when you have had and I, I follow and we support what you do and follow your newsletter and there's been many times where villages have been wiped out pastors have been jailed women have been raped and so some people say to me see it's religion religion causes this pain religion causes this violence speak to someone who has been who believes that and help them see what is really happening because this violence is happening we read about it we pray for those who are being persecuted but why is there so much uh hatred with between christianity and islam i would be the first one to say religion is a problem a religion everywhere in the world is a problem whether it's christianity or islam or any other religion Thank God, Jesus did not come to the world to bring religion. He came to bring the kingdom. And there is a big difference between religion and kingdom. Religion is you find your own way to, to know God. In fact, someone said once this. He said, all religions will take us to the same place. And then he said, think of a big mountain. And the Christians will go up on one side of the mountain to the top to meet God. And the Muslims will go up to that mountain on the other side. And the Buddhists on the others. And the Sikhs on the others. And so forth and so forth. And then it says, then at the end, all of us will be on the top and meet God. But thank God, that's not the picture the Bible tell us about Christianity or following Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself came from the mountain, came all the way down and show us the way. We don't have to try. So whenever religion becomes the focus, there is going to be all kind of problem. But when we are talking about kingdom, relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ, becoming family members and advancing that kingdom all over the earth so that people will come to know and love Jesus. That's what we're talking about. That will never cause any problem because the Bible tell us we are peacemakers. We are, we are going and love our enemy. We pray for our enemy. For the one who hit us the right cheek, we give the left cheek. Someone who's asking us to go one mile, we go extra mile. We become servant. There is a big difference. So religion is a problem, yes, but we're not here preaching religion. We are here lifting the name of Jesus and the kingdom he brought, and we are here to advance his kingdom in all parts of the earth. That's well said. Thank you. Very well said. So, I, you know, let's jump to COVID because this is a global pandemic. The world has changed forever because of the responses of our leaders and people to this uh, virus, mm -hmm. this nouveau virus. And my, I was reading an article from UK International Relations specifically about the Horn of Africa. And what they said was, a mass mobilization of financial resources is needed to deal with the oncoming negative economic impact. So what is happening there that we're not seeing here that requires this really, and I know they've, they've put all their loan repayments on hold. So what is happening in real time now as a result of, of COVID? Let me say something about COVID and then I will try to answer that question. 18 months ago, nobody, no one in the world have any idea about COVID-19. Did you know anything no. about 18 months ago? No. I'm a doctor. It was not something that I was thinking about. We learned about uh, coronavirus in medical school, but this was not something I was looking. Today, coronavirus affected every nation in the world. It changes our lifestyle. We do things differently. And economy change, health change. In the US, over half a million people died. 
and the hospitals are different how we practice medicine is different it has transformed the whole world in less than two years then i say the gospel the great commission was given to us in 12 years it will be 2000 years ago in 2033 it will be 2000 years since jesus gave the church the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations in 2000 years we have not taken this gospel to all nations but in less than two years this virus have entered in every nation has changed how we live life affected everything about uh, how we relate our health our economy how we commune with people everything changed so we must ask how can virus have done this in no time how come this gospel has not done in almost 2000 years so that's uh, for another day for another discussion that is a great discussion by the way and we're going to have that conversation because that's an incredibly powerful point but the the africa uh interestingly right now if you look uh the covid uh pandemic has not affected africa the way we feared it would what i mean by that is a great number of people have been infected but very few proportionally speaking people died of covid 19 pandemic and there is a lot of reasons why uh, uh, it's a young continent so young people do well in general uh, there is also uh, anti-malaria medication some believe it has a positive effect on the virus and a lot of people because of malaria they right. take that kind of medication and many nations including my home country ethiopia all the doctors came and asked god and confess their sins and has said, have mercy on our nation. We cannot handle this COVID pandemic. Please, God, have mercy. And I truly believe God answered their prayers. But economically speaking, it's a difficult situation. Many churches have been closed. Many pastors could not be supported because the churches are closed. Nobody is helping them. As a ministry, we supported over 200 church pastors who do not directly work with us but we send them funds so that at least for six months they could take care of their children and their family so the economy is a huge impact and it's going to take many many years to see that reversed and to go back again to do well so yeah. it's going to be challenging years ahead we're going to have a link at the bottom of this video that shows the podcast how to support uh, your ministry. And so we'll have that link on there. And uh, it would be great to subscribe to the newsletter that you put out because it's a very good newsletter. So look at the bottom. You'll see the link to Horn of Africa Missions, correct? That's right. And you'll be able to support it there as as we do. Uh, here's another one that I want to ask you. And this, this is to help us have a worldview. Okay, you know how... Uh, we, we joke that Americans know one language, other countries people know three, four languages. How many languages do you know? Four. Four. See, so, you know, it's like you were born outside the country. Mm -hmm. So, But if they, if, you, if they attend your church, they will speak two. Absolutely. Speaking At least two. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. At least two. So here's, here's the, I want to help someone who's never been overseas, never done missions, see why it's important to understand an alternative worldview. If you look at our politics and our news, Okay, we are we are consumed with what political party you're you're with. We're consumed with pro-life or pro-choice abortion. We're consumed with gender equality now, gender identity. We're consumed with the minimum wage going up. We're consumed with Social Security. Will it be there? We're consumed with free speech and of course the Second Second Amendment of the right to bear arms. These are consuming. American ideologies. This is what we talk about. This is what the news talks about. So tell me, an American that goes to the Horn of Africa, what are they going to see as the consuming thoughts and conversations and needs as opposed to what they have here? World view is huge. Uh, world view is how we look the world in our own lenses. Uh, the West look the world in a Western lens, 
And in Africa, they look the world in Eastern lens. And the Bible also has its own lens. Uh, for example, uh, give you a quick example. In the US, when time, when we think of time, we think it's like an hourglass. It's gonna run out. Yeah. So right. you wake up in the morning, you have all these things you need to do, and you know, <laughs> you have 24 hours and it is ticking. Yeah. It's gonna run out. So you are in a hurry. I must do all these things because I, I don't have time. That's time perfect. is running out. That's right. In Africa and in most third world nations, time is like a wheel. It goes around. You miss it, just be patient. It's gonna come around. <laughs> yeah. You, you miss the bus. Just relax, drink more coffee. It's gonna come back. You miss the rainy season, just hang it there. Another rainy season is coming. That's how we look time. Of course, when it comes to the Bible, time is like a straight line. There is a beginning and then there is an end. And he is doing his work through this straight line. Um, so when you go to Africa, uh, the biggest things, if they were Google in Africa, the trending things will be, COVID-19, how am I going to feed my family? Uh, who's going to take care of us? Uh, obviously, politics is also in the picture. Who is running for an office? What are they planning to do this? Uh, of course, civil war, what's going on in the next uh, neighbors and so forth and so forth. It's going on. But there's a big difference between the worldview of the church here and the worldview of a church there. Uh, I don't remember hearing the second coming of Jesus that often here. There is no this looking forward, anticipating. In, in Africa, every song, there is, so, there is something about the second coming. We're waiting, we're looking. This life will be over. There is going to be a new earth, a new heaven. We're going to see Jesus. We're looking for that. And we will be patient and perseverance on this life. And let's push forward. You hear a lot of that. Here, that's not so. Yeah, uh, And there is a big difference. I tell people, Afri God did not move from America to Africa. God is also here. But you hear a lot of miracles in Africa, more than here. Not because God is more alive there and not here. But Africans give God the first chance more than Americans give God the first chance. I tell people, if I leave and go to my car and the car doesn't start, the honest answer is the first thing that comes to mind is AAA, <laughs> not God. Let me call AAA so that they will help me. Right. In Africa, there is no AAA. So you'll always give God the first chance. You give God enough chances, you will see many miracles. He will show up every time. Well, that, that leads perfectly. You must be reading my questions here because I, I, you have some great stories. I've heard you speak many times and Hudson Taylor, who was a great missionary in the early 1900s to China, he has this phrase, impossible, difficult, done. So I would love for you to share maybe a story or two of something that you saw happen that was absolutely impossible, yet now it's done. And then I want you to t explain why it went from impossible to done. Can you think of an example? I'm just, How much time do you have? I know, I know. <laughs> I could tell you story after story after story after story. Yeah, but I, but I, you I, say but specifically too. someone. I know that someone here is watching, and you you you're you're thinking about God. You don't have any relationship with God. You're wondering who is this crazy guy talking about Jesus, and why should I follow this God and this Jesus? And I think part of it is this impossible, difficult, done faith. So just help someone process. So I'll that. tell you two. Okay. And I hope you will believe I'm telling you the truth because I'm telling you the truth. And um, we have amazing men and women in North Africa who serve Christ uh, to make him known. Uh, this couple, uh, they, they, they know they are called to reach the Arabs, the Arabic language speakers of North Africa and Middle East yeah. to come to love Jesus. So one day, they got invitation from Brazil. And the invitation says, please come to Brazil and teach us what God has been teaching you. And this couple immediately says, no, we're not coming. And the other person was shocked, saying, 
You always pray before you say yes or no. You didn't even give time to pray. You say no. He said, I will pray, but I know without a doubt God has called that to reach the Arabs. And as far as I know, there is no Arabs in Brazil. But I'll pray. So they prayed. And to his surprise, God says, I want you to go. Husband and wife, you go. So they called them, says, we prayed, I'm sorry, but God says, yes, okay, we're coming. But they said, we speak Arabic and we speak English. We don't speak Portuguese. So how are we going to serve? They said, just come. We will prepare a translator who will be with you every day. They, they were going to go for four months. And they plan all these events throughout Brazil. And uh, this young lady who will be translating their English into Portuguese. The first week of their ministry was excellent. They had a great time. They were challenging the Brazilian church. You must go. God has invested in you so much. And it is time for you to become missionary. After one week, this translator got a phone call from her husband, who is a pastor in another city. He told her, you must come. There is a problem in our church. You must come right now. So she told them, I'm sorry. My husband called me. He needs me. I must leave. He said, we still have three months and three weeks. She said, I'm sorry, but my husband needs me. I must go. And they were disappointed. So they called the pastor whom, uh, where they would be preaching tomorrow night. They said, sorry, we can't come. Uh, we don't have a translator. The guy was disappointed. So in the morning, they were having quiet times, and they were reading the Bible and praying, and they read in Mark 16, where it says, those who believe in Jesus will speak in a new language. They said, a new language? Can we ask our father to give us this Portuguese language so that we don't need any translator? The wife says, sure, it's in the Bible, let's pray. So as a baby, they just prayed, God, we don't speak this language, but we pray in your son's name. Give us this understanding so that we could preach for the next three months and three weeks in Portuguese all over Brazil without a translator. So at the evening, they went to church. The pastor is disappointed they're not preaching. There was worship. They didn't understand anything. And then the pastor got up to preach. They didn't understand anything. In the middle, the husband said to the wife, I understand what he's preaching. The wife says, me too, I understand him. So tell me, what is he talking about? She said, he said, he's talking about the Ark of the Covenant. She said, yes, that's what he's talking about. I understand him. So the husband looked back and says to the guy behind him, sir, is the pastor talking about the Ark of the Covenant? <laughs> the guy said, why are you asking me? He said, because we don't speak your language. We want to make sure that, he said, you're asking me in Portuguese. <laughs> so that day, God downloaded the Portuguese yeah. language. For the next three months yeah. and three weeks, yeah. they preached without a translator. To this day, they speak Portuguese. They write their newsletter in Portuguese. They communicate in Portuguese. So the moral of that story is to believe with faith the impossible is made possible by God. Yes. Provision always goes where purpose is. Wherever God yes. invited yes. us to do his will, he will provide what we need. I'll tell you a second story. The same couple, they were invited in Darfur. Darfur is Western Sudan. There was a lot of killing happening there yeah, many years, yeah. for many years. So they've been to Sudan, but they've never been to Darfur. So God told them, go for two months and serve me in Darfur. So they called the Sudanese pastor in the capital city in Khartoum. They said, God called us to Darfur for two months, and we don't know how much money we need. Uh, would you do a budget you know where we live so for the air ticket the hot the uh, rent for two days two months food and so forth so the pastor did a budget and they raised the bare minimum they flew to Khartoum the pastor welcomed them and then the pastor said I'm sorry I made a mistake they said what he said on your budget I forgot to include the flight from Khartoum to Darfur 
So when they recalculate, the money is gonna be gone in 19 days instead of 60 days. I told them if it was me, I said, okay, 90 days, I'm going home. <laughs> but they said, no, God invited us there for two months. We will go and we'll yeah. trust him. Yeah. So they got a, rented a small place, no electricity, no power. The cell phone doesn't work. So every morning they get up and they go minister. There is a Darfurian boy who will come, will take them. He helps them as a translator. At the, in the evening, they come home, they eat dinner, they go home. And that was good for 19 days. On day number 19, they came home, there was no food. The husband checked, there was only three Sudanese pounds. He said, what can I do? He went to a shop and bought nine loaf of bread, half of the size of my palm. So each ate three bread, and the Darfurian guy went home, husband and wife went to bed. In the middle of the night, the wife says to her husband, honey, I'm hungry. <laughs> he said, me too. <laughs> Unless God showed up, it's going to be a forced fasting season. There's no cell phone. There's no internet. Nobody will know what our need wow. is. Only God show up. Then he said, let me get up from bed and find that paper where I brought the, the, the bread and check. At least I'll get the crumbs of few and I'll feed my wife. He got up, he looked, and there were nine freshly baked loaf of bread in that bag. They knew God provided a baker angel to bake for them. Not only that, for the next 15 times, whenever they get hungry, they look that back, there will be nine freshly baked loaf of bread waiting for them. Even when they go ministry, they take that empty bag wherever they go. And <laughs> there, when they get hungry, they open, there will be nine loaf of breads waiting for them. Until one day, the husband says, I'm tired of this bread. And that was it. The bread stopped. Said, okay, if you're tired, I'll stop. But God continued to provide what they need. Where he put them. Where he asked them, come and serve with me to these people. So God, when he invites you out for lunch, he's not expecting you to pay for lunch. He will pay for the lunch. <laughs> I always forget my wallet, so I make my, my guests pay. That story is so inspirational, and I and it's exactly how I'd like you to kind of lead into the uh, end of this conversation, which is you know as well as I do, being a doctor, you see people distressed and depressed and oppressed and frustrated and scared, and they're looking to government for answers. They're looking for our doctors for answers. They're looking for you know medicine and, and vaccines for answers, and um, people just aren't finding the answers. And they're feeling restricted, they're feeling isolated, and they may feel like God has abandoned them. So speak to someone who thinks, speak to these, someone first of all says, well, I don't, if God's in charge, he's doing a lousy job. Speak to that person and speak to someone who is a follower of Christ, who has kind of lost some of their faith during this pandemic. And this new era is kind of leaving, they feel disenfranchised from the world and from God. Just give a final encouraging word to one who is, who's blaming this on God, but doesn't have a relationship with God. And one who knows God, but feels completely isolated from God. God is good. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. God is always good. And God is always for us. He's not against us. He is a loving father who knows what's best for us. This earth, this world is a, a, a fallen world. There is sin. Uh, because of sin, we see all the effects of sin. And God is not the blame. God is still the one who is inviting men and women to himself. Um, so the first thing we need to do is we, we need to surrender our life to Christ because he is a caring, loving, wonderful father. Uh, when we come to him, we surrender to try all our efforts. Uh, I'm not a swimmer. But people who swim and uh, in uh, uh, watching, saving uh, people who are drowning, sometimes they leave them alone when while they are drowning until they quit. Then it is easier to carry them and bring them 
uh, to safety. When they are struggling, it's hard to carry the person. Yeah. So right now there are a lot of people who are wrestling, trying this, trying that, trying this, trying that. And God is like saying, quit all of that. Surrender to me. Come to me. You will have rest. Uh, uh, those of us who walk with him, we know that rest. I know that rest. My heart is not in trouble. I have that confidence. I go and take care of patients, including patients with COVID. I have no fear. It's not because of anything else, but other than I know whom I believe and to whom I belong. And in him, I have all the shelter. This COVID season, if there is anything that will tell us, it will tell us one thing. That is, God is in control. He can do whatever he wants. He is in control. But through all this, he is also calling us to himself, to, he, to be family with him. He is the only answer. He is the only one who will answer our deep questions. We have tried this, we have tried that, but God is still whispering and calling men and women, calling you, come to me, come to me, I will give you rest. That's the call of Jesus. He wants to give us rest. He wants to show us how to live life and life, a true abundant life, a life that will satisfy, fulfill, and meaningful life so that we will live for the purpose he created us on planet earth. So he's in control, but he's not the blame of all this. We sinners are the problem. He, a good father, is the solution, and he is calling each one of us to himself. Well said, doctor. Well said. You know, I think uh, it is just uh, everybody's probably just blown away at the zeal that you have, and they would love to have that same zeal and that faith and that that, that delight in serving God and knowing their life matters. And I just want to tell you that I, it is an honor to uh, spend time with you. Uh, we love the work that you do. We pray for you constantly. And uh, I just want to say thank you. And we will continue this conversation, by the way, because that, that comment you made about why did COVID reach the world in two years and the Great Commission has not, that deserves a follow-up conversation. Absolutely. So thank you for that. And I also want to say, uh, you know, thank you for continuing to share these uh, videos with your friends, these podcasts. If you decided today after Dr. Zamedi spoke about having a relationship with Jesus Christ that you want to follow Jesus, there's a link below that you can contact us and we will send you some information. We'll call you. We'll follow up with you. We, we don't do this walk alone. We do it together as a family. So if you've decided, you know what, I want to follow this Jesus, there's a link where you can, you can contact us and we will get back, in, back to you and give you information. Please remember to keep sharing, keep, keep subscribing, and nothing is off the table in the How in the World podcast. This is the beautiful thing about a podcast that I couldn't do on a Sunday morning with a mixed crowd is we can have conversations that are really difficult to have and we're going to have them. If you know someone I should interview, some innovator that should we should be talking to, some great international business person, someone who's, who's, who's solving problems, we want to talk to them. Send us your requests and we'll make sure they get on the How in the World podcast. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.